heard just now read to you Psalm 119, those first eight verses of Psalm 119, it's all about this, the blessedness of the believer, the person who wholeheartedly takes in and obeys scripture. There is a great blessing for those who believe the word of God and, and live it out with obedience under the power of the Spirit of God. And in 1 Kings 13, we, we just pick up off, after chapter 12. And, and you know how chapter 12 ended with King Jeroboam making altars in Dan and Bethel and then worshiping on these uh, false shrines, these idols. He's created false worship. He's made it very convenient for everybody. He's flooded the priesthood instead of God's biblical Levites. He's flooded the priesthood with anybody who wants to be a part of it. Unbeliever, believer, whatever tribe, it did not matter. He even changed the date of the fall festival by, by changing it a whole month. So he is completely disregarding God's word. And God is not happy. And so there is no chapter break in the Hebrew Bible, but in 1 Kings chapter 13, flows right out of chapter 12, Jeroboam having been setting up these altars and worshiping the uh, bull calf that he has set up. We're going to move into chapter 13, and in this chapter we have a lion, a, a lion, the majestic animal, wild beast. We have a king, King Jeroboam. And then we have two prophets. And so we're going to look at what does chapter 13 have to teach us and why is it in this spot and, and why is this recorded? I almost think the writer of, of the Kings, when they got to this chapter, kind of, I think they had a twinkle in their eye and kind of a smile on their lips as they're like, watch the audience of the word of God as this story unfolds. And so let's see what we can learn from it today. But let's begin with prayer. Our Father in heaven, as we bow before you, we humble ourselves. We seek truth. We want to hear from you today, from the text of scripture. Father, this word is like living breath right out of your mouth. We almost want to feel the warmth of your speech as you speak to each heart here today. Father, your word is true. It is profitable. It is divine. It is without error. And woe to those who do not take heed to your word. I pray that our hearts will be soft and receptive, that we'll understand the importance of this word. And so teach us, Father, through the Holy Spirit and through the word of God, what you meant, what you intended for us in this text. And we will give you glory and honor as you transform and change each one of our lives. And we pray to the glory of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Notice how in chapter 13, it says, And behold... Coming out of Jeroboam's false worship before a bull calf in Bethel, it says, and behold, like at that same time, something is going to happen. What I'd like to do is literally just read the text to you. I need to read the whole text. So I'm going to read the text, and as we go through it, I'll give a few comments along the way. You'll, you'll find we're going to break the chapter up into five places. The scene begins in front of an altar in Bethel. Then the scene's going to move to an oak tree outside of Bethel. Then we're going to move from an oak tree to somebody's house at their table. From the table, we're going to be brought to a road. And from a road, we're going to be brought to a cemetery. And so that's kind of the layout of the pattern of the chapter. And I, and I want you to remember the text. And we're going to look at the details. And then after we do that, we're, go we're going to look for a repeated phrase throughout the chapter. Because I think that is what God intended for us to learn. And then we're going to take that and apply it. And we're going to get all that done in a short time. So are you with me? Let's begin our study of 1 Kings chapter 13. And behold, we're now dealing with an altar. A man of God went from Judah, the southern kingdom, to Bethel. Now, Bethel is only about five miles north of the border. So he's going into the enemy territory, the land of Israel, the ten tribes, about five miles. And he goes to Bethel, where Jeroboam the king is. And, and it says he went by the word of the Lord. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. So here it is, false worship, a king doing a priestly ministry, which God forbid, and he's burning incense on this altar. Can you picture this? Uh, uh, the king in his regalia and a uh, solemn service. Maybe they've already had their music and their, and their false priests and all of this. And, and edging through the crowd, elbowing, making his way, interrupting a solemn service is this man of God. Verse 2 
Uh, well, it says he went by the word of the Lord, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Then he cried out against the altar. So this man of God, this prophet from the south, comes five miles across the border. He goes up to this altar where Jeroboam is, and he doesn't even address King Jeroboam. How, how, how incredible. Instead of addressing the high king of Israel, he addresses a stone altar. Here's what he said. He cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David, and on you, altar, he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. Oh, wow. He edges through the crowd. He gets everybody's attention. He stops whatever Jeroboam's doing. He says to the altar, O oh, altar, God is going to raise up a little boy named Josiah of the house of David. Do you know when Josiah comes on the scene? 290 years later. This is a prophecy that a boy will be born by the name of Josiah, who is going to be of the house of David. He is going to be a king of Judah, and he is going to burn men's bones on the altar, which means he is going to destroy the false priesthood, destroy the false worship, destroy everything that goes against the word and the will of God. He's basically saying this altar means nothing to God, and it is going to be destroyed. Nobody knew it was going to be 290 years later, but this prophecy actually gets fulfilled in 2 Kings 23. It is remarkable that God names the boy by name 290 years before this king is born. Well, not only did he give a prophecy of this future for uh, this altar in Bethel, but he says in verse 3, he gave a sign the same day saying, this is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart and the ashes on it shall be poured out. So now that the actual sign and prophecy that Josiah will be born in a future day and do what he will do to crush the false worship, the altar, this man of God said, is going to split apart. It's going to supernaturally break apart, and the ashes on top are going to pour forth, which God said the ashes of a sacrifice must be carefully dealt with with a shovel and brought to a clean place to be disposed of. So Basically, the man of God is saying, this altar is defiled, and the ashes are defiled, and God's going to prove it. Now, this is pretty, this is, this is going to shake up a church service. This is going to shake everybody up. Look what happens in verse 4. It came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, who cried out against the altar in Bethel, that he stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, arrest him. Then his hand, which he stretched out toward him, withered, so that he could not pull it back to himself. So the king is like, get that man. And no sooner does his hand stretch out, this King Jeroboam, than his hand withers. It just shrivels up to just gnarly bone. And he can't even bring it back in. It's, he's paralyzed. Crazy. It also says this. Arrest him. Then his hand, which he stretched out toward him, withered so that he could not pull it back to himself. The altar also was split apart. And the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of God. So now the altar's broken, the ashes laying on the ground, split apart, and this, the king, with his hands stretched out, can't even move it. He's just, he's like this. Can you picture the seriousness of this? If God wants to get this king's attention, he's got it, right? Well, the king knows stretching out his hand to arrest this man of God is not working, so he tries something different. Here's a different approach. Verse 6. Then the king answered and said to the man of God, Please entreat the favor of the Lord your God. Hey, he's not mine. Pray to your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. Wow, what a different approach. Right? Whole different approach. Before he wants to arrest and take care of this man of God, and now he's begging for this man of, man of God's intervention. So the man of God entreated the Lord and the king's hand was restored to him and became as before. Now look at what the king does. Verse 7. Then the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. Before he wanted to arrest the man, now he's going to give a reward for the healing ministry. But the man of God said to the king, If you were to give me half your house, I would not go in with you, nor would I eat bread, nor drink water in this place. For so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall not eat bread, nor drink water, nor return, nor return by the same way you came. 
So he went another way and did not return by the way he came to Bethel. Strange story. He said, King, no hospitality. I'm not going to eat at your house. I'm not going to drink at your house. I'm not going to go to your house. You can give me half your kingdom. I will have nothing to do with you. God says to you, King Jeroboam, I will not speak to you. I'll speak to an altar. I will not receive anything from you. Basically, God has rejected you, King Jeroboam, for the hardness of your heart. We're done with you. And, and, the, and the old man, the, I'm sorry, the young prophet turns and goes a different way home. Oh, so that's the altar. Let's talk about the tree. Verse 11. Now an old prophet dwelt in Bethel. So he is from the northern kingdom. He's living in Bethel. And his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told their father the words which he had spoken to the king. Can you picture these boys? I don't know how old they are. The Bible doesn't tell us, but the man is old. So maybe the boys are in the 30s or 40s. And, and they're coming, hey, dad, dad, you, you should have seen the church service today with King Jeroboam. The solemn occasion, everybody is quiet as King Jeroboam's offering incense. And this man of God, this prophet from the south, edges his way through the crowd. He yells at the altar. The king tries to arrest him. The altar splits. Oh, dad, you should have seen it. Oh, and by the way, we know which way he went home. Now, this is the hinge of the whole story. The fact that the sons of this old prophet, by the way, what are they doing at that ceremony, right? Why aren't they saying something at the ceremony? Why doesn't God use one of them to speak at the ceremony? No, these sons of the prophet, they're like, hey, dad, we saw the way that this young preacher went home. Everything hinges on that. Look at verse 12. And the father said to them, which way did he go? For his sons had seen which way the man of God went who came from Judah. Then he, the old prophet, said to his sons, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him, and he rode on it. And he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. Wait a minute. Why is the young prophet from the south sitting under an oak outside of Bethel? It's only five miles to get home to safety. Like, what is this man of God doing sitting under an oak tree? Uh, maybe he's thinking, we don't know. Could he be thinking, I just lost a great reward. I could have had half of Jeroboam's kingdom, half of his house I could have had. Man, should I, what, you know, who knows? We don't know what he's thinking, but he's sitting under an oak tree. Verse 14, the rest of the verse says, he said to him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. And then he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. And he, the man of God from the south said, I cannot return with you nor go in with you. Neither can I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. For I have been told by the word of the Lord, you shall not eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by going the way you came. He, the old man, said to him, I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, bring him back with you to your house that he may eat bread and drink water. And then we have this. He was lying to him. The old prophet is lying to this young guy. Verse 19. So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. Well, that's what, the old, that's what the old man did. That's what the young man did. Let's move our attention to the table. Verse 20. Now it happened as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord, the true word of the Lord, came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried out the, to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you, but you came back, ate bread, and drank water in the place of which the Lord said to you, eat no bread, drink no water, your corpse shall not come to, this to the tomb of your fathers. Wow. The old man sitting at the table. Can you picture this? The young man's eating bread. He's got some crumbs on his beard, and he's drinking some water. And then the old prophet said, hey, everybody, God just gave me a word. You rebellious son, you rebellious man, you have rebelled against the clear word of God by eating and drinking at my house, which I invited you to do. And therefore, when you leave here, you will die. Your corpse will not go to your family's tomb. Now, listen to this. This young prophet, he doesn't argue. He doesn't get mad. He doesn't say, why did you trick me? Why did you lie to me? He, he simply Look at what it says now, because we're going to talk about the road. Let's go to the road. Let's find out what happens. Verse 20. Now, it happened as, oh, let's see. So, verse 24. So, uh, verse 23. So, it was, 
after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk, that he saddled the donkey. No argument, no anger, no speaking out. He saddled the donkey for him, the prophet whom he had brought back. When he was gone, a lion met him on the road and killed him. And his corpse was thrown on the road, and the donkey stood by it, and the lion also stood by the corpse. So now you've got the young prophet dead on the road, having been killed by a lion. You've got the lion standing on the road and the donkey standing on the road, and the lion's not attacking the donkey. He's not eating the man. They're just standing there watching. And and you come along the scene. You're coming home from the grocery store, and you're like, oh, no, there's a lion in the road, but he's not moving. Oh, there's a donkey in the road, and the lion's not attacking the donkey, and nobody's attacking the dead man on the road. So you know this. They all understand this is supernatural. Had the lion killed the donkey as well and eaten the man like he should have, a lion would do that normally, everybody would say, whoa, the roads are dangerous. There's a lion around. I think Bob and Kelly had a wolf under their deck. Talk about scary to have your dog out barking and there's a wolf. And I saw the fangs on that, in the face of that wolf underneath Bob and Kelly's deck. That was just a couple days ago. That is scary. So here, everybody knows this lion is not acting normal. The dead man has not been ravaged and eaten by the lion, and the donkey is still alive. This is God's supernatural intervention. Otherwise, they'd be going around saying, watch out, there's a lion on the road. This is what lions do when they get angry on a road. (laughs) They eat people. They kill donkeys. No, everybody knows this is unusual. This is supernatural. The word of God continues. Verse 25. And there, men passed by and saw the corpse thrown on the road and the lion standing by the corpse. Then they went and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. Now, when the prophet who had brought him back from the way heard it, he said, it is the man of God who was disobedient, literally rebellious, to the word of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord has delivered him to the lion, which has torn him and killed him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to him. Now, Interesting word. This isn't the repeated word, but it happens. Remember how Ahiah, the prophet, had torn his robe and gave Jeroboam 10 pieces of torn clothing, saying the kingdom will be torn from from Judah and given to you? There was a tearing there. What happened to the altar? The altar was torn, showing that false worship is is not right and true, and now the the body of the man was torn by the lion, meaning this man was not right. So you've got a kingdom that's right, you've got worship that's right, and you've got a prophet that's not right. All torn, the robe torn, the altar torn, the man torn. I think God is trying to talk to us about something here. Let's continue. We're now, um, we're we're on the road. This is the, the, the part that we're on. Verse 27, and he spoke to his son saying, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled it. Then he went and found his corpse thrown on the road and the donkey and the lion standing by the corpse. The lion had not eaten that corpse nor torn the donkey. And now we turn our attention to the grave, verse 29. And the prophet stood, took up the corpse of the man of God, laid it on the donkey, brought it back. So the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. Then he laid the corpse in his own tomb and they mourned over him saying, alas, my brother, they were brother prophets, So it was, after he had buried him, that he spoke to his son, saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the tomb where the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying which he cried out by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the shrines on all the high places which are in the cities of Samaria will surely come to pass. That word is true and it will happen. After this event, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way. But again, he made priests from every class of people for the high places. Whoever wished, he consecrated them, and he became one of the priests of the high places. And this thing was the sin of the house of Jeroboam, so as to exterminate and destroy it from the face of the earth. Well, that's, that's the story. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? A lion, two prophets, a king, a lot going on. I have lots of questions. I have lots and lots of questions. Where was this man of God from, and what was his name? And why, after delivering the message, did he not get back five miles into safety? Why why is he sitting under the oak tree? What's going on there? Why were the sons of the prophet at Jeroboam's service, 
and not saying anything. What's the old man doing? Why did the old man lie? Why, why did he lie and deceive this young preacher? And then, and then another question, why did God give the old prophet who lied an actual true word of the Lord? And, and then, I mean, do, do you see all the questions? And as I considered the text, I then realized none of those have been answered for us. So obviously we're searching and looking in the wrong area if we're trying to answer that. The question is, why did God give us this text? Well, the repeated phrase that you see over and over is what? The word of the Lord. Over and over, by the word of the Lord, by the word of the Lord, by the word of the Lord, as the Lord has spoken, by the word of the Lord, by the word of the Lord. I think you can find it, I think like 19 times in the text. You're talking, if God wants us to get anything, it's this. How do we respond to the word of God? So here's the application. My first application is for King Jeroboam. Oh. King Jeroboam, the word of God to the king was salvation. It was life. And he despised it. He threw it under the bus. He rejected it. The word of God to King Jeroboam was life. It was salvation. What an act of grace and mercy, wasn't it? For God to give King Jeroboam another opportunity to be saved. Another opportunity to hear the word of God and to trust and to believe the word of God. This is huge. It's a sudden act of mercy. Sometimes God's word comes into our life, and it just like lands right on top of us, and then we have to ask ourselves, how will we respond? What will we do with it? Look at how clear this was. There was a sign of God with clear power. If God can freeze this man's limb and wither it, I think God is saying to King Jeroboam, King, you have not listened to my word ever. You have been a rebellious, wicked king, turning to false worship, false priests, false days of the month. You, you have completely corrupted everything that I ever said was good and holy and right. And I want you to listen to me. And if you want more limbs to be taken, keep up what you're doing. Because I can take your other limbs. I can take your legs. I can take your sight. Don't mess with me. I am the Lord God. I think God is trying to get Jeroboam's attention. And then to prove to Jeroboam that what the man of God said is true, that altar split right away. So Jeroboam can look and he can see God's word is true. The altar split, the ashes are all over. My hand, which was withered and paralyzed, is now restored. I, I think, listen, I think God is saying, everybody, if you return to my word and you believe my word, I will restore to you your kingdom. I will prosper and bless you even now. All Jeroboam had to do was repent. All he had to do was humble himself and say, I have sinned against heaven. I have sinned against God. I have strayed from the word. I have despised and rejected God's word, and I want to return. And I think if Jeroboam would have returned, just like his arm was restored, God would have said, I will prosper your ten tribes, and you will be a great king, and nobody will touch you. I think that's true. God's grace is always available. But what did Jeroboam do? He rebuilt the altar, and he went back to his false worship. And for the next 180 years, every king is going to be critical, or every, every king is going to be criticized with these last words in their obituary. And such and such a king did the sins of Jeroboam, which Jeroboam did to cause Israel to sin. It's like everybody's obituary gets the same little tag, it's like God is saying to us something. If you continue in the ways of Jeroboam and you sin against God and you reject his word and rebel against his word, nothing good will happen. So you're here today. You're here today. In a minute, you're going to hear about the cross. You're going to hear what Jesus did on the cross. And I have shared this with many people, even this individual on an airplane. And he literally took God's word, which, listen, every time we open up God's word, and we read it at home, we read it at work, we have a Bible verse in our pocket, we hear it at church, we are hearing the God of the word. It is like we're, we're hearing and we're feeling the warmth of his breath on our, on our face. Every time you deal with the word of God, you are dealing with the God of the word. When I was sharing the gospel with this individual, trying to explain to him, the, the truth of the message, he's like, no, I already took a class on that. And this is what they said in the class. Everybody's the same. There's many ways. There's not one way. How dare you say there's just one way? 
Well, I dare to say there's one way because God said there's one way. And if you don't go through Jesus, you don't go, you don't go at all. You will go to hell. Nobody likes to hear about hell. Nobody likes to hear about sin. But if you reject the one Savior, Jesus Christ, and what he did on the cross, literally you are doing what Jeroboam did. You have the word of God, which is salvation and life. You despise it. You reject it, and you pay the consequence. You, you will perish, the Bible says. This is devastating news. Um, it could be that salvation and life, maybe you're already a believer, and you hear God's word about a certain area, a certain thing. God's word says such and such about anything. And you look at it, and you say, well, you know what? It really doesn't matter. Just to despise something means to think little of it. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. I am to love my wife like Jesus Christ loves us. There's no wiggle room. There, there's no place where God says, well, go ahead and just treat your wife with a little disdain. And eh, don't, you don't have to love her a lot, just, a, just some more. Just do a little bit better. It never says that. It says, husbands, love your wives equally as Jesus loves the church. Now, none of us will do it perfectly, but that should be our pursuit and goal. It really should. Wives, respect and honor your husbands as the church submits to Christ. That's, that is God's word. And if you despise it or reject it, this word which brings salvation and life then really becomes our judge. And it will, it will punish. It will discipline. So that's the story of Jeroboam. The word of God was his life. It was his salvation. He despised it. God was merciful to him. He didn't leave King Jeroboam alone. He kept giving him the word, the word, the word. And every time Jeroboam got the word, he dismissed it with no problem. And there's a lot of people that do that. There's a great story of uh, Spurgeon. I, I found this story of Spurgeon. I think you'll enjoy it. When Charles Spurgeon was a small lad, picture Charles Spurgeon as a young boy. His grandfather was the pastor at a chapel in Stanbourne. Young Charles noticed that his grandfather, the pastor, was extremely grieved over one of the church members named Thomas Rhodes. Thomas Rhodes enjoyed the public house, and he loved smoking his pipe and guzzling his beer. One day, little Charles announced his decision. I'll kill old Rhodes, I will. I'll kill that man. Well, after receiving admonitions that he should never talk that way, the child assured his grandfather, I shall not do anything bad, but I'll kill him, though. I will kill him. Well, not long afterwards, young Charles comes into the house, trapes in, and he declares, I have killed old Rhodes. He'll never grieve my dear grandpa ever again. His grandfather was horrified, not knowing what little Charles did. Little Charles assured him, I've done nothing wrong. I've only been about the Lord's work. Well, it wasn't long before Thomas Rhodes came seeking his grandfather, his pastor, with obvious sorrow. And then the story came out. Thomas Rhodes was sitting in a pub with his pipe and his mug of beer. Well, little Charles came striding into that pub, points a finger at him and says, What doest thou here, Elijah, sitting with the ungodly? And you're a member of the church. You're breaking your pastor's heart. I'm ashamed of you. I wouldn't break my pastor's heart, I'm sure. Then Charles walked out of the pub, and Rhodes confessed he was angry. And yet he knew the boy spoke truth. He abandoned his pipe. He abandoned his beer. He went to a lonely spot to seek the Lord. And then he went to the parsonage, and he sought forgiveness from the pastor. I've killed old Rhodes, but it was a mercy killing in the proper sense. This man was angry at the rebuke. He was angry at the embarrassment in the public pub. He was angry that a mere child should have the gall to quote 1 Kings 19 to him. But it, while it was disturbing and harsh, at the same time, it's merciful. Because if nobody had confronted him, he never would have changed. And any time the word of God confronts us, we need to change. If today you hear this message and you do not change, then your heart gets a little harder and the light gets a little dimmer until you are so hard-hearted. You're like King Jeroboam trying to arrest this man of God and destroy him. Well, there's a second application. This second application is about the man of God. For the man of God, the word of God was his safety. He had, he had a clear, direct word of God. It was his safety, and he abandoned it. God so clearly said to the man of God, do not eat bread, do not drink water, and depart, depart on a different road. 
that was a clear voice of God. And that was his safety. Had the man of God refused hospitality, refused eating, refused drinking, while he was up in Bethel or in the Ten Tribes, and he had simply gone five miles back home, he would have still been alive. There would have been no lion, no corpse on the road, no burial in another cemetery that wasn't his father's. It would have been a glorious end of a life, from what we know. But that's not what happened. He had a clear word of God, and he abandoned it. And as a result, a lion comes up and strikes him. Well, God takes his word very, very seriously. And any time we abandon truth, we've got a major problem like this guy. Let me tell you a few things. I'm going to offend people here, just so you know, but I don't mind. Um, I'm going to offend you because one of the most popular books the last couple of years is Jesus Calling by Sarah Young. Everybody's got copies of Jesus Calling by Sarah Young. But I want to tell you what she says. Sarah Young says this about writing the book Jesus Calling. She says, I began to wonder if I could receive messages during my times of communing with God. I had been writing in prayer journals for years. This is her quote. But that was one-way communication. I did all the talking. I knew that God communi communicated with me through the Bible, but I yearned for more. She knew God spoke to her through the Bible, but she wanted something more than the word of God. It wasn't sufficient, just enough to have the word of God. She was waiting with pen and prayer journal paper for God to speak to her other revelation, above and beyond what is written in the word of God. Now that sounds a lot like what this man of God is doing here. She says this as well in another spot. After many years, um, the publisher wrote this. After many years of writing her own words in her prayer journal, missionary Sarah Young decided to be more attentive to the Savior's voice and begin listening for what he was saying. So with pen in hand, she embarked on a journey that forever changed her and many others around the world. In these powerful pages are the words and scriptures which Jesus gave her. Her words and scripture which Jesus gave her. I'm sorry, but Sarah Young has taken the word of God and changed it. She has added to it. And is it a classic? Is, it's, it's a bestseller. Devotional book? It's given out as Christmas gifts. And if you have one, I'm sorry, but that's just the truth. The Shack was popular years ago. The Shack was a huge seller. God the Father was an African-American woman cooking in the kitchen, grits and things like that. Uh, the Holy Spirit was this Asian girl dressed in flowing robes, kind of semi-opaque uh, type thing. And Jesus was a carpenter in bibs all, bib, all, bib uh, overalls. Now, he, uh, he never, I don't think, actually made a claim that it was revelation that he got. But do you know what that book does? It gives you an image of God that is not true. You cannot take the infinite, omnipotent, omniscient God and, and just make him an uh, African-American woman cooking pancakes in a kitchen. And they're kidding each other. Hey, you dropped an egg there, Holy Spirit. And wait a minute. You, you, you don't do that with the word of God. You can't do that with the word of God. You've got 90 minutes in heaven. You've got 45 minutes in hell. You've got many people today saying, but Jesus said this. Jesus spoke to me and he said this. Really? That sounds a lot to me like the old prophet saying, come to my house and eat and drink. An angel, an angel of the Lord told me you can come and be safe. This word of God was safety to the man of God, and he abandoned it. He took a clear word of God, and he, he followed a very indistinct, no argument, no, well, wait a minute, tell me about this angel of the Lord. When did you get the vision? What did he exactly say? How did this come about? Why do you think I should come with you? If God already gave me a clear command, why wouldn't, why wouldn't he speak to me if I were to change it? And by the way, he gave me a clear command and said, don't change it, no matter, no matter what. What does Paul say to the Galatians? If anybody gives you a different gospel than the one that I gave you, let them be uh, accursed, let them go to hell. If an angel comes and gives a different message, let that angel go to hell. If I give you a different message, after having already given you one, if I give you a different one, may I go to hell, is what Paul says in the strongest of languages. You agree? It is not our place to take God's word and say, I can add to it, I can subtract to it, I can tamper with it, I can abandon it, I can follow other things. There's so many voices you could follow. Again, this morning we had the TV on in the middle of the night, I couldn't sleep, and some preacher was talking about, now is the moment for the miracle. By the way, 
If you owe a lot of money, but you have $50 or $100 in your pocket, you give it to me, it's seed money. I will plant the 100 for you, and you'll get, you'll get all the benefits of the harvest. Now! And I thought, that is horrendous. That man will be judged greatly in hell for this. There's no way he can be a believer in the grace of God and preach like that. Oh, this is the man of God. God's word was his protection. He left it. You know what 1 John 4, 1 says? I love it. You know the word behold in the Bible? Behold is the idea. It's, it's attention grabbing. John says in 1 John 4, 1, test the spirits. Because not every spirit is the right spirit. There is the spirit of Antichrist that says Jesus did not come from God, that Jesus is Satan's brother. The Mormons believe Jesus is Satan's brother. Um, the Jehovah's Witnesses think Jesus is simply just a, an angel, the great angel, but simply a created angel of God that, that then out of him came many, many angels. And I mean, they don't listen to them. Don't. You, you follow the word of God and, and only the word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, The word of God is breathed out by God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 2 Peter chapter 1 says, Take heed to the word of God like, dark, like light shining in darkness, because holy men of old were moved by the Holy Spirit to record these words. Sarah Young wasn't. No, she, she was not. None of these authors of any book today, I don't care what book you, you choose, if it is not the Bible, you can't trust it. Unless they quote the Bible, trust that Bible verse in its context. But don't just believe any book because it's a great self-help book. Learn the Bible in 30 minutes or whatever. Great. Yeah, that's, that's full of, of, tr of truth and depth. Those types of things. The word is sufficient. It is never safe to receive anything beyond or besides the word of God. And finally, listen to this, the old prophet. Why lie? By this old prophet's lie, a man is dead on the road by a lion. Well, the word of God was his profession, and he abused it. As an old prophet, he should have been faithful to the word of God. In Jeremiah 23, God says, For you prophets that lie about me, and you say things that are not true, woe to you, because you will, you will suffer great, great, great punishment if we take God's word and we abuse it. So the man of God, do you, do you agree he was foolish to abandon the truth of the Bible? And yet this old prophet, he is not guiltless. He is going to be found guilty for what he did. I'm going to close here, but if this word, when you read it, does not grip your heart, if it does not at times bring you to tears, if it at times does not make you rejoice over with great, great happiness, if it does not convict you of the direction you're going and show you the right way, then something's wrong. I'd be terrified. I'd, I'd feel like, God, am I like Jeroboam? Are you going to have your word speak to an altar instead of me personally? Am I going to be like the young man of God that has the word of God for safety, but I just won't obey it? I won't follow it? By the way, as a pastor, it's a very critical spot because not only do I need to instruct others in the word of God, but I must obey it myself. The young man didn't obey. It's a serious thing. So maybe, maybe today you've despised God's word. You've thought little of it. Maybe today you have abandoned it as a believer and you've followed other voices. And I could, by the way, name many voices. Oh, Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. Anybody read that? Remember when that came out, Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code? Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. Well, he wasn't married. He maybe just had relations with her, and they had children. And some of the children are still alive with part of Jesus' blood and part of Mary Magdalene's blood. And, uh, I mean, and, and I talk to people even in other countries, and they're like, oh, we love the Da Vinci Code. I'm like, heretic, you know, liar, false teacher. Get back to the word of God. This is sufficient. It's beautiful. It's, it's absolutely glorious. And so we need to, to get back to that and think about that. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this word and the truth of it. And just in a moment as we think about the gospel, it is going to be um, penetrating our heart. And for those here today that are hearing the word of God, especially now the gospel and what Jesus did for us, and then even how to live as believers, 
May we not be like King Jeroboam and despise it. May we not be like the young man of God and abandon it. It's our safety. It is our life. It is our salvation. And, and may we not be this old prophet who lied and abused the word of God. But let us hold faithfully to the truth of the word, living as your children in the midst of a wicked world. And we want the word of God to change us, the Holy Spirit to take this word and cut down to the core of our hearts, our motives and intentions. And may you produce good fruit of the spirit, love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness and meekness and self-control. And may out of a believer's life flow great and godly works that you might be glorified and Christ might be exalted. And so, Father, help us to respond appropriately today to the word of God and to not go beyond or beside the word of God, but let it be sufficient in our lives for all things.